Uh, good morning and welcome to this, the 16th meeting of 2014 of the European and External Relations Committee. Can I make the usual request that mobile phones are switched off? Um, we have uh, two apologies today, one from Hanzala, who's recuperating. I'm sure the committee would want to extend get well wishes to Hanzala, and uh, I'm sure we'd like to extend our condolences to Rod Campbell, who's had a bereavement, and um, substituting for Rod today, I'm delighted to welcome David Torrance, MSP. And before we kick off into the agenda, uh, Mr Torrance, have you any uh, interest to declare in relation Nothing to this committee? To declare, sure. Thank you very much. That allows us to move on to agenda item one, which is a report from the Committee of the Regions put together by Stuart Maxwell, MSP. It's a very uh, detailed report. Um, I'm looking for any comments or questions or clarifications in relation to the report. Thanks, Convener. It's quite an extensive report there from uh, Stuart Maxwell, and I'm kind of taken aback by the, the breadth and depth of the subjects that are covered there. Uh, of course, I was looking through it for for um, any um, inclusion of the, one of the issues that's featured regularly at, at this committee, and that's on the broadband infrastructure, all of that kind of stuff. So I'm wondering if the Committee of the Regions gets an opportunity to engage with that particular subject and. If they do, could we perhaps have a wee look at what their deliberations might have been on that, as we've asked before about this issue on a number of occasions? Okay, I'm sure that's something we could we could definitely pick up. Yeah, content to do that. Yeah. Any other comments? No. Clear. Give you an, uh, I think the report's um, exceptionally detailed, and it is, it's really really helpful. Um, and I appreciate how busy the Committee of the Regents members are on our behalf and the amount of travel that they have to do. But I was just wondering if, if maybe um, the, the report's great, but maybe at some point we could maybe do um, a kind of round table discussion with the members of the Committee of the Regents just to get a better feel for how it all operates and, and um, their experience of, of, of the year that they've had. Yeah, I actually think that's that's quite, quite a good idea. Um, uh, for something in the autumn and we can look at our work programme once we, we come back after recess. Um, but certainly, you know, given the, the changes across uh, Europe uh, with the elections, with the set up of the commission, with the commission presidency and the groupings, because it seems to be very um, a fraught exercise in the political groupings that have, that have happened. So it may be, you know, the autumn's at the opportune time to, to get an understanding of, you know, what's happened and, and where it's going, going from there. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Anything else from colleagues? Can we take the opportunity then to thank uh, Stuart Maxwell and all of our uh, Committee of the Regions members for the work that they do, and Stuart in particular for his report. Patricia did the last one and um, they take turn about, so we'll, we'll have one from Patricia at a later date. Um, can seek committee's um, uh, agreement to circulate to all the relevant subject committees? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. And moving on to agenda item two, which is our reports from the Scottish Government. Again, another very detailed and hefty document um, from a number of cabinet secretaries on um, EU structural funds, Horizon 2020, forage, foreign language learning and primary skills, and transposition of EU directives. Again, any comments, questions, clarifications? Sorry, Jimmy. No, it's the, Scottish, the reports from the Scottish Government. Oh, oh sorry, yes. No, yeah, no, no. it's paper two. Rally Coffee. Thanks, Convener. On the, on the first item that's uh, noted there on the structural and investment funds, you'll, members will recall and see on page five the item relating to youth employment initiative that will hopefully particularly make an impact in South West Scotland and Ayrshire, where I, I represent. I was just hoping to, that we'd be able to keep a a close eye on developments there, if it's appropriate for that to come to this committee, because I know members were interested in what the work might entail, and I'd certainly be interested from a constituency point of view, just exactly what happens to tackle youth employment from a European perspective in, in my constituency, so I'd appreciate any kind of update and progress with this work, convener, if we can get that brought to the committee. Yeah. Busy autumn schedule, shaping up already. Alec? Yeah, I mean, I would agree entirely with Willie on that, but I think the other the other point is that often you get 
employers um, and third sector organisations talking about the bureaucracy that can be involved with most European initiatives um, and certainly talking to employers in my constituency, Fife Council for example have a scheme, a youth contract scheme up and running yeah. and one of the strengths that they talk about that scheme is the lack of bureaucracy where employers can get on with it and a lot of employers as I understand it, are put off by some of these schemes because of what's involved in it so it would be good I think to actually get a better understanding of how this operates and what it means and what kind of bureaucracy is attached to it. Yeah. No, I absolutely agree with you. Um, and it is, I used to run a, a European uh, social funded project myself many years ago, and it was before computers, before we, we did, so it was all paperwork. But you're absolutely right, and we've, we've sort of uh, leaned on the, the wise council of Five Enterprise in the past. Helen Edie was a, a great champion of, of them, and they were always very good at, at, at um, consulting and giving um, very good resolutions to problems for this committee. So, not, uh, again, another, another aspect we, we, should, we should follow, definitely. Yeah. Jimmy. On point in number 11, uh, in the recommendations, uh, the committee may also wish to suggest to the Scottish Government that all further updates are sent directly to the Education and Culture Committee rather than uh, ourselves. I would, because we spent so much time on that, that the foreign languages in primary schools thing, and, and because I think foreign languages are important to this committee, um, that I think we should still get an update on what's happening there. Um, that's my opinion, anyway. Yeah. Rather than send it straight to theatre, because it is something we, we we did a big, you know, it, it was very much our. What was it called? The Barcelona. Yeah. You know. Yeah. The, the, the one plus two yeah. model. Um, yeah. You're absolutely right. We did. I, I mean, I think it's something that needs watching because we don't know if it's working or not. You know, it was an experimental thing, and I'm quite. In, I think the committee should keep an eye on it. Keep, keep an eye on it. I think yeah. maybe if if we can. Uh, ask our colleague Claire Adamson, she's the rapporteur to the Education Committee for Europe, um, just maybe what the Education Committee is doing with this and then we can uh, yeah. see where we go from there. Right. Yep, Claire. Yeah, I'm certainly happy to do that. Um, I think it was always a, a bit of an anomaly that this came to this committee, even though it's European languages, because it does sit very much within education and within delivery uh, in the schools. So, But um, I'm sure we can ensure that the committee is kept fully up to date on the progress. I, mean, I think that's a sensible suggestion. I think we should we should follow that. Yeah. Um, I think you're right. We've, we've this is basically our baby, isn't it? And we want to keep an eye on it growing up. Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think yeah. we should we should do that as well. Okay. There's a, a number of recommendations on page one and two. I don't know if, if anybody's got any comments they want to make. Um, they're basically just about the committee considering, you know, to follow up the reports or follow up. Yeah. Horizon 2020 is one that we've kept a close eye on as well. <coughs> so on uh, EU structural funds, uh, structural investment funds, Willie's made the, the recommendation that, that we have a, a, a detailed look at the broadband issue and maybe get some information on that. But are committee members content to keep an eye on that and keep the, the focus that we've had on ensuring, you know, how the funding streams are operating and um, the success of them. Yeah, happy to do that. And it would be the same for Horizon 2020. I think we'd be keen to have um, regular updates on that and how, how that's operating as well, given it's, 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 it's new and it has that link with small business that, that you were very keen on, uh, Jamie. Um, yeah. Again, with the foreign languages and primary schools, we, we'll keep a, an eye on that. Um, and the last section is about transposition of EU directives. And the youth employment thingy, of course, of course. I, I think Alex's point of the bureaucracy was very well made, and one of the, the aspects of the Horizon 2020, especially the conference that we held, was about streamlining that bureaucracy. And it would be really good to get some post proper feedback as to whether or not the aims of reducing the bureaucracy around Horizon 2020 have actually been met. Okay. Yeah. Okay, happy to note all of these reports and share and follow up as suggested yes. um, and forward to the relevant subject committees for their perusal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Great. okay, thank you very much. And that moves us on swiftly to agenda item three, which is our Brussels bulletin.
Jimmy. Am I right in thinking we've got the Italian ambassador coming at some point? We have. The 30th of the October, yeah. the 9th. Well, it struck me that... The 9th. It struck me that... Um, because the, the, the Italian president of the Council of the EU is obviously taking over from Greece. And uh, the priorities are economic growth, citizenship, justice, tourism, and global engagement. And I thought these were all issues that we, we should prepare to question him on, maybe on when he comes on the 30th of October. Yeah. That's the only thing I sort of drew out of it. Yeah. We'll have a business planning day in September as well, where we'll be planning out the rest of the business for the rest of the year, so we can have a more detailed conversation about what, how we want to formulate yeah. that, that session. Yeah. The ninth. Is it, oh, sorry. I've just been reminded the business plan day is in October, because it's usually September, but we've got a slight change of business in September this year. Alec. Can do that? I don't want to um, create more work for the committee, so I'm not quite sure exactly how best to try and achieve this, but it's really the question on ports and the link, the links with Europe and Scotland. Um, and I'm just wondering whether it would be a briefing or... Or what we do. I mean, in Mon constituency, we have the port of Rissai, and there was a ferry, a regular ferry, a daily ferry running to to one of the European ports, and that's that's now ceased. Um, and it would be good to get a better understanding, I think, of what the ports are operating in, in Scotland, what the links are with Europe, both in terms of cargo and in terms of passengers. And I just wonder if that's something we can we can look at. I'm not sure. It's we need to commit to do it or whether it's a piece of work that could be done for us? Well, what, what we can do is I know that the Infrastructure uh, and Capital Investment Committee has been looking at this, this issue in okay. detail. So what we can do is, is ask the clerks to coordinate with those clerks to see if we can get some sort of a briefing yeah. and then we can decide where to go from, from there because if they've already done a big piece of work then it would be, yeah. you know, we shouldn't maybe cross over that but there's that maybe be areas great. of it from the EU point of view that we can pick up on. Great, yeah. thank yeah. you. Do that. Coffee. Thanks again, convener. It's on page uh, nine of the bulletin there, and it's the item about access to finance for research and innovation. Uh, members will see that uh, through the Commission and the European Investment Bank, there's a potential pot of 24 billion euros for research and innovation for small, you know, SMEs. And the question, I suppose, is <coughs> how do we make sure that companies in Scotland get cited on this? Because you, you'll notice again, convener, that. This, this money is demand-driven, so if you, I suppose if you don't ask, you don't get. So I think it's important that when we see information like this, which looks fantastic, great opportunities there for Scottish companies, how do, how do they then get made aware of this? I know it's coming under Horizon 2020, I think, but it would be great if there was some, other, some mechanism here to alert companies in Scotland to the potential for this kind of thing, because if, if they don't make any application for any of the funding, they don't get any. There's no prior allocations regionally or geographically or anything like that. So it's, a, it's quite, quite an important pot of research money there that I think Scottish companies would love to hear about and, and find a little bit more about. No, I think it's a, a point well made and something we, we should look at when we are looking at the um, structural funds in, in, uh, in its entirety. Um, the, the other point I wanted to make on that is in the report from the government um, they're suggesting that we did very, very well from FP7, which was the, the, the predecessor of Horizon 2020. So maybe looking at how, how did we you know, punch above our weight in that and how do we maintain that and sustain it and actually grow it um, is maybe something that we should be looking at in more detail as well. Um, I know the Scottish Government had talked about a portal of information, so we could maybe look for an update on, on how that's progressing. Right, it, was a, it was an item that was a favourite one of Helen Edie. At the committee, kind of that how do we get access that and get hold of and yeah. get information and make it easy to understand and easy to apply for? So Helen always raised that at this committee quite quite rightly. That how does Scotland get access to the funds that are available? And this this one in particular is entirely demand driven. So if you don't ask for any of it, you don't get any. You don't get any allocation. Yeah. So that'd be very helpful, convener. Yeah, we can do that do as that. well. We can definitely do that. Claude Adamson. Um, Thank you, Convener. I, I was very interested in page 7 and the um, section on biofuels. Um, obviously, um, this has been a, a contentious issue in some respects in where um, a, 
developing world countries have been used to, to, to grow palm oil and it's impacting the food generation in those areas and things. Um, but I was also very interested this week to hear about a research project that's using byproduct from whisky to create biofuels and it would be really interesting if we could maybe have at some point a follow up as to how that research project is going and, and really what the global impact is of the, this biofuels directive and um, what happens to, to biofuels that are actually grown out with the EU and imported into the EU okay. and how that affects it. Another one for the list. Thank you. Anything else? There was one point that I wish to pick up, and it's a directive on nuclear safety. Um, and again, it, just much, much the same about you know looking at uh, the apparent strengthened regulatory framework um, and about co cooperation across borders. Um, and the directive actually strengthens transparency by ensuring that public has a right to participate in the decision-making process relating to nuclear installations, which I think would be something uh, of interest to, to us all, um, given that energy <coughs> is, pardon the pun, such a hot topic right now. Um, again, just again, something maybe we would, should, should seek uh, some additional information on, what that directive actually means, what it means for existing power stations and what it means for proposed future power stations. Nuclear power stations. Yeah? Okay, anything else from the Brussels Bulletin? Content? Happy to make the Brussels Bulletin available to the relevant committees and highlight the actual points that we've discussed today to the specific committees? Yeah? Content? Thank you very much. Our next agenda item is... Yeah. Our next agenda item is our uh, um, uh, evidence session with uh, the Minister. Uh, I'm going to suspend briefly to allow the Minister to come down to committee uh, and take his seat. So um, we'll, we'll suspend until um, the Minister arrives and can come back together then. OK, suspend the committee.
morning and welcome back to the European and External Relations Committee. We are continuing on with our agenda for today, which is agenda item four, which is Scottish Government's proposals for an independent Scotland. Um, and the focus of this evidence session is external affairs and international development. It is the main uh, item on our agenda today and we are delighted to welcome back to committee uh, Minister for External Affairs and International Development, Hamza Youssef. Welcome, Minister, and good morning. Uh, Russell Bain, who is the External Affairs Policy Manager, and Nicola Plunkett, who is the Head of Migration. Welcome both and Minister to our committee this morning. Minister, I believe you have some opening remarks. Yes, just a few. Yeah. Thank you, uh, convener, and uh, grateful for the committee's invitation to be here. I look forward uh, to answering the extensive questions that you have. I'd like to thank the committee for conducting uh, their three evidence sessions. I thought the roundtable discussions produced a very valuable contribution to the debate about an independent Scotland's role and place in the world. Uh, they have demonstrated the importance and influential role that Scotland already plays in global affairs, and the experts' collective evidence has again shown how much more, uh, I believe, can be achieved uh, given a yes vote in September. Uh, there brings me on to a point that I wish to stress. Independence is not just about the size of aid budgets or the number of embassies, although these, of course, are important factors. It is about Scotland being able to represent itself on the world stage, to make its own decisions, to be able to influence, to be able to interact with other international actors in its own way. Uh, this is in contrast to being represented, and I would say often underrepresented, by a Westminster government that understandably often bases its actions on different international priorities. Now, in terms of international uh, development, as was highlighted in the first evidence session of the committee, uh, Scotland is already acknowledged as taking and making a unique contribution and taking an innovative approach in certain aspects of international development, particularly in our reciprocal relationship and partnership that we have with Malawi. Uh, we also have recognised expertise in climate justice and climate change, renewable energy, in education and health improvement, uh, and indeed in academic research. This is an exceptionally strong starting point and position for an independent Scotland to make a real difference internationally as we seek to share that knowledge, share those skills and technical expertise, for example, in water and sanitisation, renewable energy uh, and education. Being a global leader in international development is not necessarily about, the, uh, about a country's size in absolute monetary terms, but the impact it can make. And if we look at various indices that measure overall contribution uh, in that uh, in international development, Countries like Denmark, like Sweden, like Norway, uh, countries that are similar size to Scotland, uh, rank higher than the UK uh, for the contribution that they make. In regards to the evidence session that you took on uh, citizenship and migration, uh, again, I thought thoroughly useful uh, contribution to the debate, uh, one that I read of with great interest. And one of the topics covered uh, in immigration, I see a significant gain uh, of independence being the power to develop our own controlled immigration system that allows Scotland to flourish, control over our own immigration system, it gives us the ability to look outside our nation and attract talented individuals from around the world. Uh, we of course need to exist, support and continue to support the existing workforce to develop their abilities to fill specialist uh, roles in sectors such as engineering, science or indeed the medical profession. However, domestic recruitment is not always possible. Uh, and uh, in these cases, uh, we need to be able to fulfil, to be able to recruit and fulfil those positions from international skilled workers. Uh, Scotland benefits when we encourage skilled migrants to move here and when we encourage international students to not just study here, but to stay on here and work in Scotland after the studies. And that's why we propose, for example, to reintroduce the post-study work visa. Uh, I was happy to see that your evidence session on the 15th of May uh, Professor Robert Wright noted the benefits of encouraging talented individuals uh, to stay on in Scotland post-study. The control over citizenship also gives an independent Scotland the chance to take a very different approach. An independent Scotland will have an inclusive model of citizenship, recognising the shared history of Scotland and indeed of the UK by offering dual citizenship, for example. Uh, the UK provides that dual citizenship with other countries and we welcome the common sense position confirmed uh, by the UK government's paper on borders and citizenship that there will be no barriers to joint citizenship with an independent Scotland. In regards to asylum, policy on asylum, uh, as the committee knows, is currently 
reserved to the UK government. While there is much uh, we can do in terms of integration uh, within the uh, current uh, reserved uh, devolved powers, uh, the, the, the overall um, circumstance does place limits on the real progress that we wish to make in terms of the asylum process. It also makes us vulnerable to the imposition of policies and initiatives that we just do not like and are frankly just plain wrong, such as the Go Home uh, campaign. Uh, and in independent Scotland, the current Scottish Government would establish a separate asylum system to the immigration system. Asylum applications, uh, in terms of asylum integration from day one, that policy would continue. Uh, we would close Dungavel, we would end the practice of Don raids uh, and the inhumane treatment of those who have uh, exercised their very legitimate uh, right to seek asylum. Uh, on the topic of the committee's final session, uh, evidence session on international policy, it's important to note that our prospectus on independence is uh, not one that rests on issues in terms of how many embassies we would have. These are details, of course, that change for all states as their foreign policy develops. Rather, we want to focus on the opportunities that independence would provide and would offer in terms of what Scotland could achieve in setting our own foreign policy. Our priorities for this are clear in Scotland's future. They're based around a very clear framework of participating uh, in rules-based international cooperation, protecting Scotland's people uh, and resource, and promoting, of course, sustainable economic growth. We believe that this framework would enable us to deliver a set of policies uh, that are focused on our national interests in accordance with our priorities. Um, I was very pleased to hear the experts' the evidence from this session, reinforcing the view that small states have the ability to be very influential and successful on the global stage, and again highlighting uh, that it would be in all of NATO's uh, members' interests uh, to have an independent Scotland continue its membership uh, of NATO. I'm sure, uh, convener, uh, in conclusion, that members will have plenty of questions on a wide variety of issues. I thank you for the opportunities and the opportunity to make uh, my remarks. I'm, uh, now very happy uh, to answer the committee's questions. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. Um, you, you covered all, all of the areas that, that we have covered. One of the things that, that jumped out for me was about the role that Scotland would play internationally and how you would see that role developing and developing in a very, very positive way. Um, how, how do you, you know, match that against some of the recent comments of Lord... George Robertson very recently saying the safety of the world would be put at risk and independence would be cataclysmic and we would be welcoming the forces of darkness. That doesn't seem to jar actually with the, the uh, independent Scotland that you have just talked about being internationalist, being you know international uh, cooperation, being working in partnership and looking at a very positive role. I wonder if you could give us your comments on that. I will try to be as diplomatic as I possibly can, because uh, I'm debating Lord George Robertson tomorrow, so I have to be very, have to use all my best lines tomorrow, I suppose. But uh, uh, in terms of Lord George Robertson, I, I think even those who are on the same side of him constitutionally have distanced themselves from those kind of uh, ridiculous remarks. They haven't been repeated by the majority of those who support, uh, uh, for example, his position in the Constitution. And I think that's correct uh, to distance himself from that. I think his hyperbolic uh, remarks and prophecies of doom and gloom uh, were ridiculous. I have the great pleasure and the great honour in the role that I have to travel across Scotland and promote Scotland and speak about Scotland and, uh, and on, on, on every continent in this earth and wherever I travel. Uh, when I tell people I'm from the UK, I get a, a, a fairly warm reception, of course. When I tell them I'm from Scotland, uh, the, the smile gets even wider. And I've never uh, once told somebody that I'm from Scotland and I received a negative uh, negative uh, reception or a hostile reception whatsoever. In terms of Scotland's priorities and uh, where we would be, and uh, we certainly wouldn't be aligned with the dark forces by any stretch of the imagination. And uh, our um, uh, the approach that we've laid out in Scotland's future, for example, continuing to be members of NATO shows our uh, cooperation and the fact that we see a responsibility to our near neighbours, be they over the Atlantic and the United States and Canada, of course. Uh, closer in terms of the European continent, that we take that responsibility to our neighbours very, very seriously. Um, and there will be many occasions where we will agree with the UK government in terms of foreign policy, and that will be a good thing for the international stage, because instead of having one voice, they'll have two voices that agree. Uh, but with independence, of course, uh, where we have a different path, 
uh, we'll be able to, to have our voice uh, heard on the international stage. So I think um, I don't want to dwell too, too much on, on Lord George Robertson. I think his remarks have been widely dismissed. I think those um, he has form in making predictions that don't often come true. And I think uh, uh, the, those who are on the same side of him are right to distance themselves from, from his remarks. Colleagues for questions? Jamie McGregor. Just on the, on the debt relief, uh, Minister, uh -huh. um, I know the Scottish Government will give careful consideration to the question of unjust debts um, and is proposing to supports moves to establish Scotland as, a, as an international centre for debt arbitration, uh -huh. which is, you know, a fine idea. How, where does it mostly take place at the moment and how do you see the, the transfer? I mean, how will you start that off? Um, the Jubilee campaign, I must commend the work that the Jubilee campaign has done uh, across the, the UK in terms of debt relief and uh, I would certainly suggest for any member that's interested in debt relief uh, to, to not just look at the proposals we put forward but uh, those by the Jubilee campaign, uh, which is uh, many of the discussions that we had. Uh, the prime example and the exemplar in terms of debt relief is Norway and they completed a debt audit uh, just at the, I think it was the end of last year, but uh, it was certainly in the last 12 months that they completed uh, uh, a, a, a debt audit. So they got outside auditors to come in uh, to 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 have, do a complete debt audit of the countries that owe them debt. And I know that, of course, debt audit will be able to uh, provide the framework by which to relieve debt uh, to to the developing world. And the UK government has made moves and. In, in that regard over the previous years as well. And so there's an example and there's a precedent that's there. I suppose our argument is that it's not gone uh, nearly far enough. And so we're giving very, very careful consideration uh, to the issue of, of, of debt relief and we're continuing to talk to stakeholders. Uh, the, the, the principle is one of, uh, of, of absolute fairness and, and justice and I think the member would recognise this. It is, uh, um, you know, it's in, in, inconceivable that this debt that, that has been racked up, which, uh, by the way, the debt that is owed from the developing world far outweighs any of the uh, contributions of aid. Um, and some of that debt has been uh, racked up from military and defence equipment that has been sold to some of the most brutal dictators the world has seen. Uh, for example, Saddam Hussein, uh, Robert Mugabe, General Suharto, the Argentinian military junta, just to name a few. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's a principle of fairness. So we, we look at the Norwegian uh, debt audit and, 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 and we look at that in terms of careful consideration. Um, and, and I would love Scotland, that, that, that is a role that I would love to see Scotland play in terms of debt arbitration. Now, if we can get to a position um, looking at the Norwegian model uh, of, of, of debt relief and ensuring that our future export uh, and credit agency uh, for an independent Scotland does not um, does not uh, commit uh, the developing world into unfair uh, debt, then I think that would be a great exemplar for the world and a great standing for us on the international stage. And I think this is the thing with small states and small independent countries, is they have to carve themselves a, a very unique niche uh, and they can then uh, look to be an exemplar and a leader in that niche. And I think debt arbitration is perhaps one of those examples. Minister, just, just uh, following on from, from the theme that Jamie McGregor has kicked off there, is Part of the Scottish Government policy is a do-no-harm policy, and we heard uh, from many witnesses that that was a very positive step, but they were looking for a more proactive, sure. do-good approach um, across all uh, Scottish Government policy areas, but obviously particularly in relation to international development work. Um, I hope we can give us some insight into your thoughts on that, yeah? Yes, uh, I think, again, the work of uh, NIDOS, the Network of International Development Organisations Scotland, uh, has to be commended uh, to the committee and uh, reading your evidence sessions I think it was Gillian Wilson who was making the point about having pro-poor uh, policies and I, th I think she's correct and, and in some regards um, some of that can be done uh, at the moment within the devolved settlement and we look to do that so for example um, we work very closely with education officials and uh, cabinet secretary for education and myself work very closely on the agenda for international development. For example, £600,000 was made available to development education centres across Scotland. That £600,000 was to enable education uh, of Scots uh, living here, of course, within our schools uh, in terms of the importance of international development so that from a young age we can sow the seed of international development so that when they grow older, 
uh, they will not uh, believe that international development should be sacrificed for domestic uh, spend, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so we're already working uh, across. So I think, I, think, I, think, I think actually those that make that point and made that point at the committee uh, is one for us to, to certainly reflect on. Perhaps there is a better term than, than do no harm. Uh, the, other, the other term that's often used is policy coherence for development, but it's not the sexiest title in the world. But um, there is perhaps a uh, need for us to think about, um, uh, think about how we term it uh, a little bit better. Uh, but uh, there's already that uh, uh, joined up working intergovernmentally, and uh, you know I work very closely with education officials, health officials, and many others to, to see what more we can do. And President Banda's, uh, our former President Banda uh, of Malawi, her visit here last year uh, showed that where John Swinney, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, for example, was part of a round table looking at investment uh, in, in Malawi to see how uh, trade can help. Uh, to lift people out of poverty too. So that, that work cross-governmentally uh, and proactively is happening, uh, but with, inter with independence, of course, when we have the full levers of trade and we have the full levers of tax and economy and full control over these devolved areas in defence and arms, uh, and, uh, sorry, defence and trade in terms of mitigating arms trade, we can be a lot more holistic in that approach. Ed Adamson. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, Minister, obviously the, the evidence sessions we've been taking are to inform the debate about Scottish independence and, and uh, two possible futures for Scotland. I was interested if I could pick up on two points from your opening remark uh, remarks. Um, the first one is about the, the willingness to put in an end to dawn raids. Obviously this has been a very um, important issue in Scotland, not least the of which was the campaign of the seven young women from Glasgow, the Glasgow Girls, um, now the subject of award-winning musical by the National Theatre of Scotland, um, where they campaigned against Don raids and, and their own communities. And at that time, we had a Labour government in Westminster and a Labour, government, um, a Labour coalition government in the Scottish Parliament. Um, but Jack McConnell was unable to secure the end of Don raids um, as the First Minister of Scotland at that time. And the other area is in the area of the Fresh Talent Initiative. Again, Jack McConnell brought this forward as leader of the Labour Party. It was welcomed. It was recognised that Scotland needed um, a different um, position in terms of post-education visas because of um, the needs of the economy here. And yet, again, what we've seen is that um, being taken away. And I just wonder if you could expand on um, what you say think that means about the relationship we have within the devolved settlements and what opportunities there would be with independence in those two areas. Yeah, I, mean, I think the point is, uh, is well made. Uh, you know, Lord McConnell is somebody that I have a huge amount of respect for. Uh, since I came into the role as Minister for External Affairs, uh, I've never been short to credit him for uh, the work that he did in the re-establishment of that connection with Malawi. Uh, he's somebody that I go to for advice often uh, on, the, on the subject. In fact, I was on the phone with him yesterday. Uh, and uh, I think he was absolutely sincere in his, uh, uh, in his, in his want to end on raids and uh, his desire to end on raids. I think he was absolutely sincere in that. I think he genuinely saw it as a stain on the conscience of this, on the conscience of this nation. Uh, and so I don't doubt the sincerity of Lord McConnell, and that's what makes it even more tragic that there was a man who was incredibly sincere about uh, his intention and desire to end such a horrific practice of six officers beating down your door at four in the morning and dragging your children out to a detention centre is not something that is justified, not even as a last resort, uh, let alone a first resort. Um, but you're absolutely correct. The fallacy is that uh, regardless of that desire as First Minister uh, of Scotland uh, and having his own party and government at the time in Westminster, he was still unable to do anything about it. There were some words about a possible MOU, uh, but that was never fulfilled and Don Ray's continued and uh, uh, some will say they even continue to this day. There's still still, still uh, asylum seekers who, who claim that it happens in Scottish Refugee Council and others who have claimed that it still happens to this day. And so uh, it does not bear well because uh, even if you have two governments aligned, both in the Scottish Parliament and in the Westminster Parliament, it doesn't mean that you'll have, uh, that, that even if the political will is coming from the Scottish Government to do something, uh, that you will necessarily get it. And the Fresh Talent Initiative is just a continuation of that, where, again, a uh, really excellent policy, and credit uh, the, the uh, previous government for 
having the foresight to, to bring that in, I think, an excellent initiative. Didn't come without its problems, and they should be tweaked for any future uh, post-study work visa, but generally a, a very good scheme. And I noticed the comments from uh, the evidence session from Professor Robert Wright in this one in particular, saying that he just could not understand why on earth you would not have a system uh, that would that you look to retain those uh, who, who studied here. It just makes no economic sense. It makes no sense whatsoever uh, to spend time and effort on studying some of the best minds from across the world and then letting them just go back to either their own country or, or leave for uh, destinations are new, and in fact, he also mentioned in his evidence and in the evidence given to the committee that we're getting beaten by other countries in this, other English-speaking countries, I think Australia uh, and Canada in particular, who have seen a dramatic uh, increase in international students, whereas, uh, of course, we've seen a, a decrease in students from India, uh, from Pakistan and Nigeria. Uh, and so you're absolutely correct to, 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 to make reference to the Fresh Talent Initiative, and again, the relationship between the Scottish Government and, and, and the UK Government. Uh, this was removed, as you know, the Fresh Talent Initiative by uh, the UK Government in 2010, and I can't see any other reason uh, for it being removed other than this arbitrary cap uh, that they have on numbers, which, of course, by their own admission, they're not going to going to meet, and student numbers shouldn't even be in that, uh, in, in that consideration in the first place, regardless. Um, so uh, there's clearly benefits to introducing a post-study work visa. Now, as, as logical as I think it is, as being a member of the government, as logical as the First Minister thinks it is, as logical as the Parliament, because we had a debate, of course, on, uh, on some of these matters recently in the, in the Scottish Parliament, and there was almost, I think, pretty much unanimous agreement that a post-study work visa would make a lot of sense uh, across that Parliament, regardless of how uh, desirable the universities of Scotland see it, as, uh, as re regardless of how desirable... Uh, the Institute of Directors uh, see it, regardless of all of that, I wouldn't even say political will, but political, civic society, educational, academical will that there is to be a post-study work visa, uh, we can do absolutely nothing about it because the UK government at the moment is hell-bent on uh, reducing uh, numbers and including student numbers uh, within that. And uh, uh, I don't have any faith that if there's a future Westminster government of a different colour that that will change whatsoever. I've been given no indication that they would do that. In fact, their rhetoric on immigration is just the same as the, as the government that's in at the moment. And uh, I think it's deeply, uh, it's deeply sad. But, uh, of course, my uh, hope and desire is that on the 18th of September, if the people of Scotland choose to vote yes, then this will be uh, a policy that, of course, will reintroduce because it makes sense uh, economically, uh, but also educationally and socially as well. Supplementary. Um, I, Minister, thank you. I, and I think um, we have many examples of how you know Scotland's attitude right now is perhaps different from the rest of the UK in some of these areas. But one of the, the things I think that caused great concern in Scotland last year was the Go Home campaign by the Home Office. And I just wonder if you would be willing to comment on, on how you think if there is a no vote that that policy might might continue in the UK? I'm deeply concerned by the rhetoric and the tone of the debate uh, emanating from Westminster. Um, and I must be fair to the, 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 the Liberal Democrats, uh, they, they often challenge uh, that rhetoric and uh, must, give, you know, must be fair in that regard. But from the two main parties um, that dominate Westminster politics, there is a uh, uh, dreadful uh, tone uh, of, of debate and uh, my plea has always been not to try to out UKIP, UKIP but to challenge UKIP's rhetoric uh, and there is a general election less than a year away that is nerves about uh, of course how well UKIP might do and so the response I believe as the Scottish Government has done should be to challenge that and confront that rhetoric. Uh, now I was uh, deeply disappointed that UKIP want a seat here, for example, in the European elections, but to put that in context, they came fourth here with 10% of the vote, whereas they came first with um, almost 30% of the vote in the rest of the UK. That is because you cannot out UKIP UKIP. If people vote for UKIP because they want, uh, you know, they want to, uh, they want immigration to be slashed and cut and they believe the negative rhetoric, then they're going to vote for UKIP. They're not going to vote for somebody who's a lighter shade of UKIP or a watered-down UKIP. They're going to go for the full... They're not going to go for semi-skimmed when you can get the full fat stuff. And so um, my, my plea is to, to challenge that, but I don't see it being challenged. I don't see it being... And even from the Liberal Democrats, who I was being fair to, they, of course, are part of a coalition government that 
that decided to, 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 to have home office vans drive around parts of London emblazoned with the slogan, Go Home. And even Brand Street in Glasgow had posters that said, Go Home. I mean, this is the worst of, of insults. And there may be members here who've had to face um, some sort of racial or ethnic uh, abuse. And if you have, and there's somebody who has, there is no worse insult than being told to go home because you don't have another home. I lived my whole life here, spent my whole time here. Uh, this is the place I, I don't have another home. I couldn't go anywhere else. And to see that, and I've been, I've been, you know, I've, that's been shouted at me before by, uh, you know, members of the Scottish Defence League and um, uh, and others before. And I, I, it really grinds as an insult. Uh, it deeply hurts, and you know, I, I, I'm deeply worried about the, the the tone of the debate. And I don't see anywhere where it can change. Now, Scotland could change it if we choose to have an immigration policy. Uh, that is, that is uh, to our economic and educational benefit. If we have an asylum process that is fair, that is compassionate, that is humane, then actually we could be a progressive beacon, not just for these islands, uh, but for the whole of Europe, because that tide, and we saw in the European elections, the rise, of course, of the Front National and other parties, we could be a leading light for the rest of the European continent that actually, uh, you know, we're going to stand up against the negative rhetoric, we're going to challenge it, and, you know, we will economically and educationally and socially benefit from it. Thank you very much. Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, Convener, and good morning, Minister. Um, I'd like to open up a little discussion, if I can, about Scotland's role within the European Union as, a, as an independent nation and the kind of influence that we might bring to bear as a small member state. Um, you can't have failed to have read or heard about the current spat between the present United Kingdom Prime Minister about the, the Juncker issue, the John claude Juncker issue. And during our committee's discussions over the past while, there has been a debate about whether Scotland's role as a small nation can be influential enough, and of course whether we would be better off as part of a big, big nation state. And I'm just checking my notes here from the current news about this issue about Mr. Juncker, it appears that the United Kingdom has one ally on this matter out of 28 member states. So, generally speaking, what would Scotland's role be as a small nation state? How, how would we influence our, our colleagues and partner countries within the European Union to represent Scotland as, as best as we possibly can? And how would we grow and develop our relations? And could you comment, would you care to comment on the, the UK position, which appears to me to isolate Scotland yeah. much more than we would wish to. I mean, uh, I think we've commented a number of times publicly that uh, you know the way to negotiate within the European Union is not to hold a gun to the, to the European Union's head. I mean, it just doesn't work as a negotiating tactic. It's not how you, it's not how you negotiate. And uh, you know, this 2017 uh, promised referendum uh, in and out of, of Europe is exactly that. And uh, you know, it's not winning the UK uh, any friends by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and actually, small states within the European Union have been incredibly successful. In fact, there's evidence to, to suggest, and I was just looking at the article, uh, just there's evidence to suggest by LSE uh, professors that, um, that France and Germany uh, are actually amongst the least successful EU states in negotiating legislation, and actually smaller countries um, are, are much better in terms of negotiating uh, their position within the European Union. That's by uh, Jonathan uh, Golub, uh, who's an LSE uh, professor. And, uh, again, I would... Uh, uh, commend the, the, the article to the committee, and um, so, so, so small states can can have great success uh, in terms of, of negotiating their position. Uh, an example of that would be, of course, the fact the first minister said last week at the Royal, Royal Highland Show uh, that if Scotland was an independent country, we would have had a 3.5 billion euro dividend. Uh, that was based on Ireland's negotiating position in terms of per hectare. Uh, so Scotland uh, would be able to have its own voice. Uh, Scotland would be an engaging member uh, of the European uh, Union. Uh, yes, the European Union needs reform. I don't think there's a single member state out of the 28 that exists. There's not a single member state that doesn't think that the European Union needs some sort of uh, reform. Uh, but uh, the way to do that is by being a constructive partner, and that would be Scotland's role within the European Union as a constructive, uh, small, independent nation. Do you see a risk in the future if we remain part of the United Kingdom and we do on the back of a vote, perhaps, in the rest of the UK, leave the European Union? Because very recently, as recently as yesterday, I think, Danny Alexander warned in a speech in America 
that that risk could, could put at risk over three million jobs in the United Kingdom if it were to leave the European Union. Could you comment about the impact that, that something like that might have on Scotland? They've opened a door now that can't be closed, and uh, it is, uh, you know, it is a very dangerous and risky tactic to have taken. And uh, uh, I'm deeply, deeply concerned. And not only am I, but uh, many people, regardless of which side of the constitutional setup that they're on, have expressed deep concern at the fact that there will be a, a promised uh, EU referendum in 2017 for precisely the reasons that you say. And in Scotland. We could easily see the situation with Scotland uh, as, a, as a country within the United Kingdom would vote to remain within the European Union, but the rest of the UK uh, would vote to, to, to leave. And Scotland, of course, by default would have to leave. That would have a huge impact on jobs. It would have a huge impact on our educational institutions. It would have a huge impact on us socially. We have 160,000 European Union citizens living here in Scotland to make a valuable contribution to our country. Um, and so uh, it is... It is, it is uh, it is a huge risk for Scotland, uh, and that is why uh, uh, the safest way to guarantee Scotland's continued membership of the European Union is, of course, with the yes vote. And uh, there are many that have even publicly uh, commented in this matter. Professor Peter Higgs um, of, uh, uh, of uh, Nobel Prize-winning uh, uh, fame uh, has commented, and many others have commented publicly on the uh, on the dangers of negative EU rhetoric and uh, even leaving the EU. But uh, it's not helped um, the more. Uh, the more edgy the talk, the more uh, uh, the more uh, hyperbolic the rhetoric, uh, then the more the chances of that uh, EU exit uh, in increase. And Scotland does not want that, and the Scottish people do not want that, and the Scottish government certainly does not want that. So back to the potential of Scotland as a small member state within the, the European Union. And you mentioned, Minister, in some of your opening remarks about it's not about the numbers of embassies and size and so on and so forth. It's more about impact. How do you see Scotland developing our relations with small member states? And how do you see us reaching out to potential new members of the European Union? And I should caution you, we have guests behind from Serbia, Montenegro and Albania who, are, who have met some of before and have a particularly warm relationship with Scotland. So how will we, how will we work with the smaller member states in Europe and how will we reach out to other countries that wish to join the European Union and how will we engage with them? Yeah. Well, we welcome your guests, uh, first of all, that have come from Serbia, uh, Montenegro and Albania. And uh, if it is their first time to Scotland, uh, let me assure them that it's always this sunny 365 days a year uh, in Scotland. Uh, that is the only lie that I will tell in the committee. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, in Scotland, we will, we will be good at doing that. Uh, you know, small countries, as Dr. Julia Carbo had mentioned in her evidence, small nations are able to, you're able to, to steer a small ship uh, easier than a big ship. So, you know, you're able to be a lot more flexible, a lot more nimble in terms of the areas that you wish to, 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 to delve into in, in depth and those that you wish to, to, to perhaps not go into so much depth in. Uh, you're also able to, to change tack. You're also able to negotiate, uh, be nimble in negotiations. And so other small nations across uh, the European Union, but also actually across the European continent that are not in the, in, in the EU yet, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look to, to have that alliance of, of smaller nations and look to, to build that, that. Those small nations have been, as I say in the report uh, from, from LSE professors and others, uh, those small countries, by building those alliances, have actually been more successful uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of negotiations. And Ireland's a, a great example. Uh, of that in a country that we would look to have enormously close ties and even closer ties than we have uh, at the moment with independence. Uh, and Ireland have shown how they can do that. They have negotiated one of the, the, the be better deals in, in regards to cap, um, cap, cap reform. And so, you know, we would, we would certainly... But look, that's not to say that if the rest of the UK continued to be within the European Union, we wouldn't work closely with them. We absolutely would. Uh, the UK and the rest of the UK would be our closest ally. Uh, but we are in a position to be small and nimble enough, wherever Scotland's interests are, to make sure that we form and build alliances uh, with them. And small states have shown how they've done that effectively with the European Union, and I think Scotland could be a useful addition to that. And look, an independent Scotland will be seen by many uh, as a gateway into the rest of the UK in regards to its, our, our relationship, because our relationship with the rest of the UK will be, as often is said by Scottish government ministers, one of, of course, one of equals. Uh, you know, going from going from perhaps a, a surly lodger to, to, to a good neighbour is often the, 
uh, the, the phrase that's used. And I think you know, having that, nobody will have a closer relationship with the rest of the UK uh, than indeed Scotland would have, and independent Scotland would have. And so for other people who want to connect to the rest of the UK and the rest of the UK government, I think Scotland would be an absolute conduit to do that. So that relationship with the rest of the UK is very, very important. But as you rightly, as the member rightly says, uh, you know, developing alliances with smaller nations will be, uh, uh, will be to our benefit and to the benefit of others. And I think we'll be able to negotiate much better if we do that. What strengths do we bring to the table? You mentioned a few uh, items there, and again in your remarks about climate justice, renewable energy. Do, are members of the European Union uh, aware of, of Scotland's strengths and what we bring to the table in expertise and skills and so on? And what would your plans be to, to make sure that that, that that offer is made to Europe? I, I see Scotland as bringing more to the, the European table than we would hope to get from it. I always think that we can make a great contribution in Europe. So what, what kind of strengths does Scotland offer? And, Europe, if we become a member state, absolutely. <coughs> the member is absolutely correct, and uh, we have a great uh, office out in the. We have an EU uh, Scotland uh, office. Um, of course, that would uh, uh, look different if there was an independent. Uh, if, if we were continued our membership as an independent uh, nation, but they do a great effort in trying to bang the drum about all things that are good Scottish, uh, trying to trying uh, trying their very best in the limited resource uh, that we have. Um, so there is some awareness of what Scotland is good at, but at the same time there's not nearly uh, enough awareness of how much and the breadth of what we do and the depth of what we do. So, for example, uh, a couple of weeks ago I held a roundtable in Brussels on international development. You had many representatives from uh, other nations, but also other organisations, NGOs, um, excuse me, and also a representative from the European Commission, amongst others, uh, there too, and they were blown away by how much we're doing in international development. They had no idea that this small uh, you know, country as part of the, the, the UK uh, with its own government uh, and its own parliament was doing so much. They had no idea how much we were doing in Malawi, Rwanda, Tanzania, Zambia, uh, across the subcontinent, uh, and they were fascinated by it. And the round table was maybe two hours long, but it could have been 20 hours long, and we could have still been, still been talking about it. Um, so I think in terms of an independent nation, yes, we have a really important role to play in uh, uh, and international development and the development commission and the EU takes its obligations to the poorest in the world extremely seriously. Uh, it, is, it works closely with the United Nations for its Sustainable Energy for All initiative, which is about making sure that the whole world is connected and has access to energy and clean to energy. And Scotland, of course, is a world leader on renewables uh, and on clean energy uh, in terms of our most ambitious targets and the investment that we put and the capability that we have, we'd be an absolute leader in Europe in terms of uh, clean energy and the, what we can bring to the Development Commission in that regard. Uh, I think educationally too. I think uh, you know 1% of world-class research is either authored or co-authored by a Scot. Uh, for a country of a 0.1% global population, that's not bad going. Uh, and so I think in terms of research, we can bring a lot to, to the table uh, in our own right. Uh, we are, of course, the, we'd be the largest oil producers uh, within the uh, EU, uh, largest uh, coastal waters in terms of fisheries. So there's, 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 a, there's a lot of uh, interest, mutual interest, between Scotland and, and European Union in terms of what, can, what, the, what the contribution could be. But I see us, uh, in terms of our contribution to, to humanity, uh, and global humanity, uh, even within a European context, as being one of the key roles that, that we can look to play and that we can bring to the table. Jimmy McGregor. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Convener. Um, the Minister won't be surprised to hear me say that I believe, as do others, that um, Scotland already contributes a great deal to the EU table through the UK. But I'd like to get back, if I may, to a question on immigration. Um, on the specific Scottish Government proposals, some witness highlighted issues regarding the proposed geographical incentive for immigrants to move to low-populated areas of Scotland. Now, as an MSP for Highlands and Islands, um, this is obviously something that, that is, would be a very good thing. And, and, um, but there was difficulties, possibly, um, between a geographic and skills-based criteria for immigrants. Um, could you, would you like to comment on that and, and say how you plan to do, to, to, you know, to, to, to um, encourage people to move to the areas that you know, are, are lowly populated and, and perhaps need the... Yeah. Well, I thank the member for the, 
the question. I bumped into him in the canteen yesterday and uh, he promised he'd be nice to me at committee, which I'm pleased uh, he's lived up to thus far. Um, uh, I, I think uh, the question is, a, is an excellent one and uh, I was pleased to read uh, what the uh, experts uh, said in this regard. Uh, I also note that local authorities uh, would very much um, welcome, uh, you know, uh, have welcomed in a report yesterday, have welcomed uh, migration as a positive thing, as a good thing um, for them. And uh, what, we, what we recommend is, um, you know, ins looking and exploring the possibility of incentivisation for uh, those uh, uh, rural areas in particular, but not, not exclusively rural areas, uh, that would um, look to exploit immigration where there's a skills gap, uh, perhaps, but also where there's a demographic challenge in you. You've highlighted it before, actually, in some of your evi in the evidence sessions about, uh, I think, Argyll and Butte uh, having a, a steep uh, population decline, and I think Inverclyde as well, uh, in, in, in your evidence session uh, previously. And uh, so, so, so migration can be a, a tool to address that. Uh, the way to do that is um, we have a very good relationship at the moment with COSLA Strategic Migration Partnership, which is led by Councillor Jean Jones. Uh, and many other councillors uh, too, and we have a great relationship with COSLA, uh, Strategic Migration Partnership. We speak to them uh, on, on many uh, issues, and anything that we look to do in terms of regional incentive would have to be done hand in glove with the local authorities in those areas. Um, I should say incentive doesn't always mean financial incentive. It can mean financial incentive, but it doesn't always mean financial incentive. There can be other incentives that can also be drawn uh, on uh, as well in terms of uh, you know, visas and uh, you know, uh, getting acts, doing it, doing it through a sponsorship uh, model too. So regional flexibility in other systems uh, across the world is often worked on a, on a sponsorship uh, model that uh, will allow you to work in one particular area and not out with that area. So uh, we're exploring that at the moment, and, and COSLA uh, and the Strategic Migration Partnership in particular are important partners in that discussion. Right. Um, also, witnesses. Um, in our previous um, meeting, specifically discussed how members of the CTA, membership of the CTA, the Common Travel Area, um, might affect immigration policy in an in independent Scotland. Again, w w would you like to comment on that? Uh, yes, it's um, an issue that uh, has been raised a few times in the, in the Parliament and uh, you know, the common travel area has existed for, for 90 years, as the member will know. Scotland would continue to uh, be a member of the common uh, travel area. Uh, but it is not uh, impossible by any stretch. In fact, it's very possible uh, to have your own immigration system and yet be part of the common travel area. And our experiences tell that. Ireland uh, doesn't uh, have the same structure, uh, same immigration system uh, as the UK, for example. It, uh, it has a, a green card system, uh, whereas the UK has a points-based system. And the system uh, we would have would be similar to the UK's. It would be a points-based, tier-based system. Uh, yet they operate within the common travel area. And, and um, in fact, the Irish government, uh, I should read the quote so I don't misquote it, the Irish Department of Justice um, spokesperson said on the 24th of January of this year, uh, the common travel area in no way alters our control over immigration or visa matters and who can or uh, and cannot enter or reside uh, in Ireland. And so, you know, the Irish government uh, have said through the Department of Justice that there would be no, there's no alteration, there's no pressure on them to, 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 to alter their immigration system uh, because they're part of the common travel area. And our system would not be uh, hugely different, but it would be tailored to Scotland's needs. Uh, where Scotland's needs are, we would open up points or tiers where there's, a, where there's a skills demand, where there's a demographic demand, where there's an educational demand uh, to do so. And I think that's the important thing at the moment. The, the current immigration system that the UK government has uh, is deeply uh, damaging Scotland educationally uh, and also economically. And there's a range of experts uh, from the International uh, Institute of Directors right through to the Universities of Scotland who will say just that. Can I bring in a question on the Nordic Council at the moment, or is that...? Um, there's yeah. a couple of supplementaries on this section, and then I'll bring you back in. OK. okay. okay. Jamie, give, give us a Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, just to follow up on, on Jamie McGregor's point, Minister, um, we uh, had evidence from our witnesses who welcomed the um, Scottish Asylum Agency, and the Minister will know that that is something personally I have been advocating for, for many, many years, um, to have compassion, and especially if it's young 
children who are unaccompanied asylum seekers to be dealt with by our children's hearing system and our local authority child protection teams rather than any sort of a borders agency. But we had supplementary evidence from um, Sarah Craig at Gramnet, who I'm, I'm sure you, you know very well, who had suggested about whether the Scottish Government intended to include an immigration asylum chamber as part of the Scottish Tribunal Service. Now, maybe putting you on the spot on that one right now, but it was certainly a very interesting um, development from the conversations we had um, about how you know this asylum agency would operate. In. Yeah, I have great respect for uh, Sarah Craig and the work that she's done, and uh, I also know, uh, convener, that this has been a, a matter of uh, great uh, personal interest to you uh, and campaigning for you uh, before you were even uh, elected to this to this parliament. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so we have had discussions with Sarah Craig and uh, and those at Gramnet, and I think Gramnet do a fantastic job. And uh, uh, you know, from an, from, a, from an organisation that was only expected to reap in you know fifty thousand pounds for the university, who have now just received a grant in the millions, uh, you know their 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 work uh, speaks speaks absolutely for itself, and I commend it again as I have done for other organisations. I also commend Gramnet too, uh, in order to, for the for other committee members to see the work they do. Uh, Sarah Craig has has mentioned her work on tribunals and her thoughts on tribunals to us uh, very early on, actually after the production of the white paper. We held a session with. Uh, with a number of stakeholders who are interested in immigration and asylum, and she mentioned uh, her, her thoughts on the tribunal system and how it should work. Uh, it's fair to say, uh, Convener, we're still in discussions with Sarah Craig directly as an individual, uh, but also with Gramnet as an organisation. I think they have very good ideas. We need to look at practically how that can work uh, as well, and we have to work closely with our justice colleagues in order to make sure that does work. Uh, but you're absolutely correct. The system will be based on fairness. It will be based on compassion and humanity. Uh, in terms of an asylum system, and I think that's the problem with the current system. That um, you know, the the, the rhetoric, uh, you know, does uh, you know, there's no justification at all for the treatment. But the rhetoric, especially, does not justify the treatment. I mean, at the moment we have three thousand asylum seekers. As a rough estimate, I mean, three thousand. It's it's not even a tenth of Hamden Stadium uh, that you're talking. I mean, three thousand people is 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 uh, so people sometimes conflating the numbers. It doesn't help with the, the, the rhetoric. So our system will be one that's fair. And there will be people, of course, who are refused asylum. And uh, we're currently, again, in discussions with people like the Scottish Refugee Council and others about um, how that would be dealt with. But uh, the system will not only be, will not only be fair, um, it will not only be compassionate, but it will also be efficient. And that's also one of the problems of the current system, is that it's not efficient. And the tribunal system is an example. The current tribunal system is perhaps an example of that. Um, getting the case right at the first time uh, is going to be incredibly important for a, a system in an independent Scotland. The fact that a large proportion of cases are currently overturned in appeal shows how flawed the system uh, is. So, you know, there's there's efficiency, there's fairness, there's compassion. All these things have to be mixed, and there's a delicate balance to be had. But Sarah Craig and uh, the work of Gramnet uh, is already informing what we're going to do in that regard, and will continue to inform us. Just quickly, um, would would the same policy apply to? trafficked individuals, given that at this point in time, uh, traffic status is determined by the border agency, but um, uh, people don't seem to have a right to have appeal, um, and they have to volunteer for the national referral mechanism, rather than, you know, being cared for and being treated as a victim rather than, than a criminal. Um, and I think that's something, yeah. obviously, this parliament and across all parties take very, very seriously, is the status of trafficked individuals. Yes, and again, I, I know you have a personal... Uh, interest in that, and you've done a personal, uh, personally done a lot of campaigning on the issue of uh, traffic people, in particular, of course, traffic children and traffic women. And, and I think the the the, the articulation of the policy, uh, as you say, uh, convener, is a commonsensical one, is one that we'll explore. Uh, as I say, we haven't determined exactly how our tribunal system and uh, uh, how our system will, will will work in that regard. But um, uh, of course, we don't want to see the criminalisation, certainly the forced criminalisation of of those who are trafficked, that they are not criminals, it is not their fault, uh, they are victims and they should be absolutely treated in that manner. You're welcome indeed. Claire Adamson. Uh, thank you. It was really a, a supplementary um, to the points raised by Jamie McGregor and Willie Coffey. Um, the UN target of 0.7% spend of GNI on International Development Minister, um, the UK met that for the first time last year. Um, maybe somewhat surprisingly for such a rich nation. Um, but I have, have concerns about the indication that the UK government would wish to include arms trade as part of that international development work. 
I just wonder if you would care to comment on how an independent Scotland would you view its international development spend? Uh, you know, we have been uh, absolutely unequivocal uh, in that uh, regard. We've said that we would absolutely uh, meet that commitment of 0.7%, but not only would we commit, it, uh, meet to, uh, commit to meet it, we would enshrine it in legislation. Uh, as well, which uh, you know I think is incredibly important, and we aspirationally look towards uh, targeting uh, one percent in the future uh, as well. So we are absolutely unequivocal uh, about that, and you know you put that in context, and the committee can do the the, the arithmetic themselves. But I mean, it's you know seventy pence out of a hundred pounds. It's not a it's not a commitment as some of our press would uh, like to tell you that is uh, that is uh, you know uh, eating up the coffers uh, by any stretch. But it is the smallest, the least. Uh, least that we can do uh, in terms of our commitments to the poorest uh, in the world. Uh, so I welcome the UK government uh, meeting that 0.7% target. I think we, we have to be fair and uh, uh, welcome that. Uh, it's good that they have met that and I hope that they continue to meet it. The problem is, of course, that um, uh, each of the parties promised to enshrine that in legislation and they have not lived up to that uh, promise and they will not live up to it. Uh, uh, until the next general election, if they promise to or not promise to, the, the manifestos are still being devised, but uh, they haven't enshrined it, so that gives us worry. That also has, of course, staffing implications for Diffid based in East Kilbride, because a number of staff there now, uh, additional staff, uh, been uh, created to, in order to fulfil that 0.7% commitment, and by Diffid's own accounts, uh, that have been explored by uh, the International Development Select Committee in Westminster that will be see if there's not a continued commitment to 0.7%, there will be a drop uh, in, in, in staff uh, numbers. Uh, in terms of military spend, um, uh, it was reported, uh, I think it was last year, actually, it was February 2013, it was reported that David Cameron would look to potentially spend money from uh, Britain's aid budget on, on, on the military. Uh, Oxfam uh, were incredibly strong about that, and we absolutely agree with Oxfam. Um, you know, money should be spent on uh, international development. Money should be spent on schools and, and, and not soldiers. And that was uh, that was a very strong message that came from Oxfam and from international NGOs across the piece. But we very much uh, we would be concerned about that. Uh, we would not spend our aid budget. We would give an absolute commitment not to spend our aid budget on uh, military uh, or defence uh, operations. If nothing else. Uh, as well as being wrong in principle, it's also very dangerous. Uh, you know, aid workers are some of the bravest people that I've ever come across. I've had the pleasure of giving the, the Burns Humanitarian Award uh, out before. Uh, and uh, they are some of the bravest people who give up their lives here to go work in some of the most difficult conflict zones in the world. Uh, they are already in danger of being, you know, confused as enemy spies, often as working for the other side, as operatives. And so they already tread a very, very difficult line. If you're choosing to spend aid budget on defence or peacekeeping, even or you know any element of military, any element of military, uh, then 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 you, you're in danger of conflating the two. And in Scotland, you know, in Scotland we're not we're not um, you know fortunately we've 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 lost aid workers in the field. Uh, Khalil Dale, uh, Linda Norgrove, uh, of course, we've lost those aid workers in the field and. Every single one of us, whether you're UK government, Scottish government, uh, you know, uh, supporters of independence, supporters of the union, all of us <coughs> uh, deeply, deeply sad at such tragic events, and, and we feel uh, deep sadness at that. Um, but spending aid money uh, on any type of military operation will only serve to conflate the two, and that will only uh, increase the danger that aid workers face. Thank you. Jamie McGregor. Back to uh, a new theme, I believe. Yes. Um, now, in uh, the white paper, it states that Scotland will not require the same scale of diplomatic service as the UK currently maintains. Now, that sounds to me as though that could be taken uh, to say that Scottish people will not get the service they now take for granted. Would you comment on that? Yes, I mean, disagree with um, uh, the... Well, that's for the white paper. No, no, I agree with the white paper clearly, because I endorse the white paper fully, but I disagree with the, uh, uh, the, the uh, conclusion that you've reached from uh, what the white paper says. Uh, the white paper says very clearly we'll have 70 to 90 uh, diplomatic services across the world. Now, smaller countries and those of a similar size, that is what it's based on and modelled on. It would be absolutely uh, uh, incorrect to say that uh, countries... 
uh, like the Nordic countries, perhaps Scandinavian countries that are similar size of Scotland, uh, have less of a diplomatic uh, or consular service. Consular services are incredibly important, but the world that we live in, uh, of course, uh, you have to be very targeted in terms of the contribution you want to make internationally. But in terms of consular services, it was uh, in your own evidence session uh, that some of the experts, of course, said that uh, there's a number of ways of extending your reach without uh, necessarily, uh, you don't have to have hundreds and hundreds of embassies across the world. That can be done through co-location, it can be done through sharing. Uh, of course, EU citizens can use each other's embassies as currently stands uh, as well. Uh, so there's a number of measures whereby um, uh, you could do that. Uh, also, it's fair to say of the 70, 70 to 90 embassies that we'll look to have in, in, as an independent country, of course, uh, uh, large, a huge priority for us, one of the five priorities for us is consular services. And therefore, where Scots regularly look to travel uh, will be one of the considerations in terms of where we open embassies to. Um, you know, I, I obviously not, can't go into detail of all the embassies that we look to open in terms of 70 to 90. Some of them are highlighted in the white paper, but, you know, uh, I wouldn't think that we would have an embassy straight away in the Kingdom of Tonga, for example, you know, a population of 100,000 people, uh, where Scots don't often travel, some will. And that's not a reflection on the Kingdom of Tonga. It looks like a beautiful place to visit. But, um, you know, we would have to be very, very um, targeted uh, in our, uh, because, of the, 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 the uh, because of the impact that we would look to, to make. Uh, but that wouldn't stop Scots, of course, uh, if they needed consular services and there wasn't a Scottish embassy directly there, it wouldn't stop them getting consular services. They could do that through, uh, through, through, through other, for example, uh, EU um, embassies uh, as well, and plus other arrangements that Scottish an independent Scottish government may well have with other countries, be that the UK, Ireland, or, or other countries. Um, you also, uh, the Scottish government has also stated it would seek closer relationship with the Nordic Council of Ministers. Now, my question is, how will this work, as current members uh, have never considered admitting another member? And in fact, Professor Bales um, states that... Um, Nordic cooperation has two pillars, pillars, the Parliamentary Nordic Council and the Nordic Council of Ministers. Neither has ever seriously considered admitting a new member. Um, so do you think that is, is, is actually a, a feasible possibility? Uh, Scotland, uh, as the White Paper says, will seek a closer relationship with the Nordic Council of Ministers. That does not necessarily mean membership. I'm not taking it off the table, but it doesn't necessarily mean membership. It means, means we'll be able to work uh, closer with the, the Nordic Council to determine our relationship with them. Uh, there is another. There are other possibilities uh, by which to do that. Uh, uh, you know, there are possibilities that we could explore, for example, with observer status. Uh, there are other avenues to explore a closer relationship. Uh, we should not uh, take it to mean, and the member should not take it to mean necessarily and exclusively that although we wish to seek a closer relationship, that we seek membership. Uh, that that's not what's said in the white paper. Okay. Thanks. Got an opening for other members to come in. David Torrance. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, uh, Minister. Um, on immigration again, um, Scotland has a huge skills shortages in certain, certain sectors, like engineering, which I come from. Um, if a person or an individual moving to an independent Scotland was wanting to seek citizenship, would they have to sit a written or oral exam before they could do it, apply for it? Uh, thank the member uh, for, for the question. Uh, we've said that we wouldn't have an equivalent to life of the UK test as a current life in, of the, of the, life in the UK test, uh, which, you know, I, I remember uh, Immediate Outlet, uh, I think it was Scotland Tonight, uh, the popular current affairs programme in STV that was doing the uh, discussion on this test, and they, I think they had like 10 people sit it, and, you know, 9 out of 10 failed it. I mean, and these were people who were born here. Uh, including the presenter, I think, who also failed the test. Uh, I don't know if any of the members around the committee have, held, have, have, had, have done the test, but uh, it's not the easiest. And uh, I think these, and I, again, this was reflecting some of the evidence that you received. I think these tests on um, on, on, on UK history and uh, you know other such things, I, I think they're they're vacuous, and I don't think they actually determine anything. So we wouldn't look to have a life and life of Scotland test that would test your history of when, um, you know, to test your, your history and uh, other, other such uh, uh, things in, in Scotland. Uh, but what we do say very clearly in, Scotland, in Scotland's future, the white paper, is that for those that are coming to fulfil a, a job criteria, for example, and you mentioned the engineering, I think that's an excellent example to pick up on, uh, they would have to have a working knowledge of English or Gaelic. 
uh, and you know that makes sense because English is important for integration purposes. I know that from my own familial experience. I mean, I have had family uh, who have been here since the sixties, sixties, and their English is is, is not uh, was not for a long time at the standard it should have been at. Uh, and uh, once they started taking English lessons, uh, once they started to, to 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 speak with us in English. Uh, once their English improved, actually, you could see a whole host of opportunities that would open up for them. So English, and uh, you know, of course, uh, recognising Gaelic too. Um, you know, English English uh, provision will be important, and so we'll be we'll, we'll have suitable criteria to determine uh, English provision. But there won't be such a thing as a life in in Scotland test. Okay. Thank you. Very much, I was, I was wanting to come back to uh, the issue that was raised with, by Jamie McGregor later on the diplomatic services and so on, Minister, and you mentioned the, the proposal for the 70 or 90 or so missions, and you're probably aware that, that some people have posed the question about whether Scotland starts from scratch after independence, but many of these assets are common assets, commonly shared with the UK. Now, despite all the rhetoric about that occurs on this side of the political debate before September. Post-September, if there is a yes vote, do you see the relationship with the UK being strong and positive and supportive of Scotland's objectives? And do you see uh, a situation where we would seek to, and the UK would seek to, to share these commonly held resources that have been built up over a number of years? Or do you think, or do you support the view that some have that somehow Scotland would be starting from scratch? No, I don't, I don't, don't support the idea of Scotland starting from scratch uh, whatsoever. You know, the, the process of the referendum is one that all of us, uh, regardless of which side of the debate that we sit on, should take great pride in. Uh, the fact that two governments that are diametrically opposed on just about every single issue, uh, particularly the one on the result of the referendum, were able to come together sit around the table and have a peaceful, legal, mandated but tough negotiation uh, that hasn't seen a nosebleed, let alone any other drop of blood. I mean, I think that is to be commended. And when I travel across the world and I speak about this, I do it with great pride and I don't take anything away from the UK government uh, or indeed, of course, the Scottish government for being mature uh, and reasonable uh, enough to, 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 to come to that settled, mandated legal process. Uh, which is an important point. So that's the foundation, that is the starting block of the referendum. Now that, you, you know, you start as you mean to go on. And uh, the important paragraph, of course, in the Edinburgh Agreement is, the, is paragraph 30 about um, uh, regardless of which way the result goes, both governments will respect the outcome uh, of that vote uh, as well. It is absolutely accepted by the vast, vast majority of be it legal experts, political experts and others. Uh, that uh, there will be a, a negotiation, of course, uh, the day, uh, the days after uh, a yes vote, and uh, there will be about a division of assets and liabilities. You cannot have one without the other. Uh, it is not possible. My dad's been an accountant for 40 years, and I didn't inherit any of his accounting genes, but uh, nonetheless, even I can tell that you have to have an equ equitable division of both assets. And liabilities, so that, that that is accepted, and so Scotland wouldn't, uh, you know, wouldn't be starting from scratch from the base point that, for example, uh, the Gers Figures government's expenditure revenue Scotland report shows that in the last 33 years in Scotland we've contributed in every single one of those years, every single one without exception, uh, more tax per head than uh, the average UK. So if we've contributed more towards public services, towards the maintenance and upkeep of diplomatic embassies to high commissions across the world. Out of an absolute principle of fairness, how could anybody argue that we would not be entitled to a fair share of that? I mean, I, can't, I just cannot understand uh, that argument. Um, so, uh, no, Scotland would not be, be starting uh, from scratch. Uh, the overseas properties uh, of the, the, the UK uh, are extensive. The value of those are extensive, and Scotland would absolutely be, uh, of course, uh, entitled to its fair share. And maybe I can just read you a quote from uh, Danny Alexander, of course, the uh, chief, uh, chief to the secretary, uh, chief uh, to the treasury, uh, and he said uh, last uh, he said uh, uh, last month. Um, I was just trying to figure because time goes so quickly. What month when? But yes, last month on the 28th of May, uh, 2014, uh, when asked if Scotland would be entitled to a share of the assets, and I'll quote directly, he said, uh, "Okay, so of course assets and liabilities will have to be divided up through negotiations. I don't think that anybody." 
thinks that that process would either be to the net benefit or net disadvantage of either Scotland or the rest of the United Kingdom. It is something that would have to be negotiated. So if the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Danny Alexander, can say that, then uh, there's no reason that, that, I can, that, that I see that anybody else could possibly say that we would be starting from scratch. Minister, if I can turn your attention to some of the evidence that, that we received from um, Professor Alison Bales, who uh, joined us by video conference from, from Iceland. Um, uh, and it's on this, this section of our inquiry on membership of international organisations. And, uh, of course, my personal feelings about membership of NATO are a matter of public record. But um, Professor Bales had suggested that membership of NATO... Um, the connection between a country being a member of NATO and it having or accepting nuclear weapons in its territory and that the majority of current NATO members have never had nuclear weapons on their territory. Would you be able to sort of nail for us today the, the debating point um, that has been used to suggest um, you know, that Scotland could not be a member of that organisation and other organisations? And I want to follow that up with some human rights issues af afterwards. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, again, I obviously entirely agree with Professor Bales, and I, I read through uh, her evidence session, which I thought was uh, was uh, absolutely uh, comprehensive and articulate on, on this point. I thought there was no room for ambiguity whatsoever, and that was also uh, shared by a number of experts in that similar session. Uh, they made the obvious point uh, that uh, 25 out of 28 uh, member states of NATO, of course, do not uh, possess nuclear weapons, and 20 out of the 28 do not uh, host um, or, or, or possess nuclear weapons. And so Scotland, uh, of course, uh, is committed to removing and the safe removal of Trident with the uh, negotiation uh, with the, the UK government to do that safely and responsibly within the first term uh, of, the, of the Scottish Parliament, uh, as we say in Scotland's future. Uh, and there is no contradiction between that and uh, between wishing to be a, a, a continuing our membership of NATO. It is it's inconceivable to have a North Atlantic Treaty Organisation without a key, not, you know, key geographic location of the North Atlantic. It just doesn't seem to me conceivable to be able to do that. And so, as uh, Professor Bale said, um, you know, she says, I want to state firmly that there's no connection between a country being a member of NATO and it's having or accepting nuclear weapons on its territory. And, you know, I, I agree entirely with her assessment that she articulated uh, to, your, to your evidence session. Well, up to that evidence from uh, Professor Bales, um, Bruce Adamson from the Scottish Human Rights Commission had expressed um, not not real concern, but you know raised the issue of how do we ensure that you know a Scottish human rights um, charter or legislation or you know whatever we, we we formulate that to be, and I know that we do have you know a Scottish human rights strategy, um, how that will then. Um, play within other organisations where maybe there is concerns about human rights and how can we maybe have an influence on ensuring that that human rights and, and compassionate based um, a, you know, debating uh, situation actually arrives and, and, and is very well enshrined in, in any negotiation that we have with any um, uh, worldwide organisation. Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, this is one of the the beauties of a uh, yes vote on the 18th September is that we get to, uh, you know, we, we we get to inform the future direction of our country from the very foundations, and um, I think in your evidence throughout um, your evidence session, although there was some disagreement, I think between um, uh, Bruce Adamson and, and Pro Professor uh, Tompkins. Uh, on this point, but the written constitution, I definitely agree with uh, Bruce Adamson on this point, that written constitution uh, could absolutely provide a, a fantastic opportunity in order to codify uh, those rights, uh, codify them, strengthen them, uh, so that we have those foundations here in Scotland. And then they are absolutely uh, the core foundation for when we have discussions with international or multilateral organisations, or even in our bilateral discussions uh, as well. And the Without the powers of independence, we're already trying to do that to the best of our abilities through the Scottish National Action Plan uh, on, on human rights, being carried forward by the Scottish Human Rights Commission, Professor Alan Miller uh, and his team, uh, which is launched by the, the, the Deputy First Minister uh, as well. Uh, already there you have, and that's not that's not purely an inward-facing document by any stretch, it's also an outward-looking document uh, if you read through it uh, as well. So there's things that we can do at the moment, but uh, if you want to entrench and codify uh, those human rights, then we can do that, and we have the opportunity opportunity to do that 
uh, with a written constitution, which will then, of course, as you quite rightly uh, allude to, convener, would, uh, would inform our discussions multilaterally, uh, but also bilaterally. And just as, a, as an addition to that, uh, uh, just as I'm worried about the immigration tone and rhetoric coming from uh, south of the border from the UK government, uh, so too am I concerned about the noises that are being made about human rights in that regard. And we saw uh, a little bit of, of, a, of a, frankly, a debacle about the so-called Bill of Rights, which I think has now been completely shelved, uh, which was a, a bit of a fudge. And, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's elements within uh, the current uh, Conservative Party uh, that is leading, of course, the coalition that wants to see the, uh, you know, wants to see a, a, a removal or at least a, a weakened link to the, the Human Rights Act, and uh, that is worrying. I'm, I'm delighted to say that uh, in my work with the, the Council of Europe that the Scottish Human Rights Action Plan was subject of extensive um, conversation and a presentation by Scottish Government officials in Strasbourg only very recently um, and looking a number of other countries looking at that strategy as a blueprint for, for their way forward. So, um, you know, we're already leading the way in some aspects here and that's, that's to be welcomed. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, any other questions from... Claire, have you got a follow-up? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, it was just um, when you were mentioning the, the, the office and David Minister, obviously East Kilbride is part of my region and within that region I have a CSA organisation with HMRC and Motherwell and Diffid. And I was just wondering if you could maybe say about um, what the plans in an independent Scotland would be for, the, for those um, civil service jobs currently um, that are delivered from Scotland. We've been unequivocal in the, in the white paper and stated many times as a matter of public record that we would look to have uh, preserve, uh, con uh, preserve continuity of employment. And uh, that means that uh, absolutely we'd, of course, enter negotiation with the UK government. Uh, those that are based in DFID are among some of the most committed and, uh, uh, you know, some of the smartest uh, individuals that I've come across. I think they would be a great asset to a future independent Scotland in regards to its international development uh, uh, function and what it chooses to do in international development, but also uh, because of their international experience uh, too, uh, they will be of interest I'm sure to, to a future Scottish Foreign Office uh, as well. So there will be plenty of opportunity. We would like, of course, as a matter of um, uh, it will be a matter of negotiation. We are determined to preserve their continuity of employment, and I've said that uh, many a time. Um, but of course the UK government is also entitled as their, as their members of staff to, to be part of that negotiation discussion of course uh, as are the unions, the PCS and for example with the, the matter of DFID uh, and the other reserved uh, functions that you mentioned. So it will be, be a discussion between those partners and uh, they would be a great asset uh, for a future uh, in, uh, independent Scotland and international development but also foreign affairs. There will be plenty and plenty of opportunity and very exciting opportunity uh, as well, but it will be a matter of discussion and negotiation with the UK government. Um, we have committed, of course, to a policy of no compulsory redundancies. Um, the UK government, uh, to my understanding, uh, has not. So if they haven't, then I would continue to urge them to do that, uh, to, give, um, to give further reassurances. Thank you, Minister. Okay. Thanks. <coughs> Thanks very much, Convener. Minister, I wonder if we could um, raise the, the issue of the pound and the currency and the, and the euro with you that quite a number of my constituents ask me about will Scotland keep the pound and so on and so forth. Um, the gov Scottish Government's status position is it will continue to use the pound. Uh, and as I understand that as members of the European Union, Sweden doesn't use the euro, and nor indeed does the United Kingdom. What will Scotland's position be when becoming a, a member state of the European Union? What currency will we use? Uh, you know, it's not even the Scottish Government's position, although it is. It's not just the Scottish Government's position. Of course, it's also the UK Government's position. And we've seen that from a report, an article in The Guardian, uh, about a, uh, a UK Government minister saying that there would be a currency union. Uh, we had uh, Ruth Davidson saying that she would be arguing for a currency union should Scotland become an independent nation um, if it's in Scotland's uh, best interest. So we've seen uh, that kind of... Uh, that is not just the stated position uh, of the Scottish Government. Indeed, uh, this, is, of course, came out of uh, a Fiscal Commission working group, which was a group of independent Nobel Prize winning uh, economists like Joseph Stiglitz or Jim Malise and others who said they explored a range of options, uh, but said, of course, that a currency union 
uh, with, uh, with the rest of the UK would be the absolutely ideal uh, optimum for both Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom. Uh, the member is correct. There's not a single country in the European Union that has been forced to join the euro. In order to join the euro, you have to voluntarily join ERM2, uh, the European uh, Exchange Rate Mechanism, and uh, you cannot be forced to do that. And he mentions Sweden, and that's an apt example of that. Sweden has not joined uh, ERM, and so uh, cannot be forced to join the euro. You have to be within ERM2 for a minimum of two years. And so if you don't choose to join that, there's no way you can, you can, you can join the euro. Uh, it just makes sense. It's a commonsensical position. Politics is politics. And what is said the day before uh, the 18th of September is very different to what is said on the 19th of September. And common sense and mutual self-interest dictates all else uh, when it comes to that kind of negotiation. So if the £60 billion worth of trade coming from the rest of the UK to Scotland, uh, just to put that into context, that's more exports than Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa and Turkey combined. Um, uh, then it would be incredible to imagine that, uh, for no other reason than spite, that uh, the Chancellor would suddenly slap a transaction tax on those businesses that export. Uh, similarly, Scotland adds and contributes £40 billion to the balance of payment to sterling. Uh, what would be the... I mean, it would be a... Forget a, a, a crash, uh, the, the sterling would fall through the, through the floor if there was a £40 billion wipeout in terms of its balance of payments at the stroke of a pen. And then, of course, there's the, there's the issue that we tackled earlier on in terms of division of assets and liabilities. The uh, Bank of England, which, of course, is the bank of the entire UK, has been nationalised since 1946. So you and I have been contributing as Scottish taxpayers. In fairness, not since 1946. Neither you or I are old enough to have done that. But um, since 1946, as a country, we've been contributing through our Scottish taxpayers, as, as Scottish taxpayers to the Bank of England. And so the uh, equitable division of assets and liabilities would say that it's... Um, uh, you know, the Bank of England is ours just as much as it is anybody else's. And then, of course, there's a final point that um, you know, uh, there's 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 no way of stopping a country from using a, a, a currency. It's an international tradable mechanism. Uh, the point is to do it within a, a, a currency union. It makes sense for both Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom, so that you can have uh, stability and so on and so forth. So, what is said before uh, the vote is very different to actions that will happen after the vote. What do you say then to the uh, the remarks made by the current Labour shadow Chancellor Ed Bowles on, on the issue of a currency union? And he said, and I'm trying to get the quote quite right here, I can't imagine being in at the start of that negotiation, never mind the end. And folk have interpreted that as as an intention to, to resign if, if that circumstance were to be brought about. What, what do you make of that position of a possible future Labour government next year deciding to oppose the, the spirit that's contained within <coughs> the, Edin the Edinburgh Agreement and oppose a currency union in Scotland? Uh, I don't think it's uh, what the colour of the government is uh, or what the mixture of the colours of the government are. If you go by current pollings, it could be it could be anything. It could be a UKIP Tory coalition. It could be it could be anything. I mean, uh, polls uh, don't indicate uh, exactly uh, what government we're going to get in 20. 15, but whatever the colour of that government is, whatever the hue of that government is, uh, both uh, mutual self-interest in terms of Scotland and the rest of the UK, uh, and common sense will dictate. And uh, uh, Fed Balls has put his job on the line in that regard, then um, that is a very risky manoeuvre for an individual to do. But I, I'm neither bothered about what Ed Balls has done or said. Uh, common sense, as I say, will, uh, will dictate, and mutual self-interest will dictate. Any final Jimmy. Well, just on Willie his point, since he's raised the question of the currency, uh, Minister, I mean, if on September the 19th um, we get a, a yes vote, I would certainly, whilst as, as, as a Scot, still want to join NATO, I would still want to join the United Nations, I would probably feel sore about losing the representation of 270 embassies and this being replaced by 70 to 90 offices, according to your white paper. Um, and above all, I would argue to keep the pound because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a brilliant currency. Can you give me a guarantee we would keep the pound? Yes, uh, we've said that. We would absolutely keep the pound uh, because of the reasons that I've outlined uh, to, to, to my answer to, to Willie Coffey. Of course we would keep the pound. It would be in everybody's self-interest, including... Your own, you've highlighted the point absolutely perfectly, and I commend you 
uh, for doing that, because although you clearly disagree with uh, independence and uh, you know that is uh, respectful and uh, that's fine to do that, of course, uh, while you absolutely reject independence, uh, you understand the pragmatic, uh, pragmatic uh, reasoning behind keeping the pound. And so, if you can see that, and you're somebody, who... okay, then I don't want to lose it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But can so, you and tell you're, me? And you're, you're absolutely fair to, to to have that position. I wouldn't argue with you, or, you know, well, uh, in that respect. I mean, we'll dis we'll agree to disagree because I'm not going to be able to convince you about the merits of independence, and nor are you going to be able to convince me about the merits uh, of the union. Well, the point is, even somebody who is so entrenched in their position opposed to independence is able to look at the pragmatism and say, actually, I would argue to keep the pound. That is exactly why George Osborne would do the same, because I'm sure he's just as reasonable uh, as you are. Um, I won't speak for him. Um, <laughs> well, in I'm that case, uh, my final point on that point is, is who will be our lender of last resort? No, who will be Scotland's lender of last well, resort? Uh, the well, as I said, the Bank of England will be uh, well, is ours because we've contributed to it since 1946. Uh, uh, as Scottish taxpayers, uh, of course, it will be uh, will be within that framework that we will operate. So uh, the Bank of England uh, is uh, an asset uh, that, uh, in fair negotiation, if you're going to take a portion of the debt, you get a portion of the asset too. So the Bank of England would be uh, included in that respect. OK. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think we're straying dangerously away from the topics <laughs> that we, we should have been looking at. But um, can I, I thank the Minister and his officials very much for, for the evidence you've given today. I, I'm, I'm, you've exercised a lot of our points and, and answered a lot of our questions. Um, uh, can I thank you very much for that? Um, the next, uh, and I'm just going to close the meeting actually, and wish you all a restful but hopefully very busy uh, recess. Um, and we will see you all back on the 9th of October, where we'll be take evidence from the Italian ambassador. Thank you.